normal in the ordinary course of human life, human affairs, is basically whatever we're used to. Because one of the things human beings are remarkably gifted at is getting used to stuff. And that is um, a corollary of one of our greatest strengths and unique gifts and abilities as a species, which is our adaptability. There really are very few species in the world that can, that can live in so many different environmental conditions as we can. Hello and welcome to another episode of Idioms of Normality on Future Frame TV, the collective podcast series of Traces Dreams. I'm your host, Dr. Paul Mason, and I'm joined today with someone who I have been yearning to interview ever since I've heard about this book coming out, Daniel Marte, the co-author of The Myth of Normal, Trauma, Illness and Healing in a Toxic Culture. Daniel, thank you so much for being with us. Thanks, Dr. Paul. It's great to be here. Although I have to say, I feel like I'm here under false pretenses. All this time, I thought I was going on the show Idiots of Normality, which obviously I would qualify for. <laughs> this, this is idioms. I don't know, man. I should idioms. I should rebrand pretty it. Fancy, pretty fancy. <laughs> I like to I, bamboozle people with big words. China. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, normality makes idiots of us all. It does. Hey, great line. Ooh, quote, <laughs> quote, unquote, Daniel Marte, 2022. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now, before we launch in, tell us a bit about, because you've got a really rich biography and, and tell us a bit about the perspectives and experiences that bring you to the question of, of normality. Yeah, I have one of those biographies that's long, not by virtue of my my eminence, but rather by virtue of my inability to commit to any one damn thing. Um, I do a lot of things. I uh, was born and raised in Vancouver, British Columbia. I now live in Brooklyn, New York, which is where I'm coming to you from. Uh, I am principally when I identify myself professionally, I always locate myself at the center um, or I always locate the center of myself at um, being a musical theater writer. So I write lyrics and music for the stage and I write, sometimes I write the script as well, but I often work with playwrights to create shows and then I'm, you know, involved in writing the songs. I've been doing that for the better part of 15 years. I got an MFA at New York University in that topic. Um, and I've been finding a way to keep it going ever since then. Um, but obviously that, that doesn't always pay the bills. But I've written five or six shows now, still working away on some of them. Um, it's the kind of thing that you have to do it for the love of it. They say you can make a living, you can make a killing in musical theater, but you can't make a living. So you better love it. So Which I do. And so from musical theater to the question of what is normal? Yeah, I mean, it's it, it seems like a bit of a, a, a stretch, right? But that's where the other sides of my biography come in. Um, I obviously am the son of someone who's been writing about health and wellness and um, mind, body, health, and, and the roots of illness in trauma and all kinds of stuff to do with that for a long time. And I've I've collaborated with him in various ways over the years. I've been his editor on previous books. And then we've led a workshop together on parent-adult-child relationships, um, which we'll be writing our next book about. And then it, it was almost a natural fit for me to hop aboard this one where he had been working on it for quite a while, several years, was pretty daunted by it. It's a huge topic. So I came aboard. So I'm also a writer, you know, I mean, bringing, importing my, songwriting skills and my my way with words and my sense of rhythm and harmony and all that into the prose writing space the nonfiction writing space helping him get this book out there and, and making my contribution to it and then there's the uh i call myself a mental chiropractor as well which is a um, a service that it's a, it's a moniker that was given to me by someone but i think it's it describes what I do with people when I'm working with people better than any other term. I'm not a therapist. I'm not a coach. I'm a mental chiropractor. And I, cr I created this thing called mental realignment. I like well, it. exactly. And it's <laughs> mental realignment, mental realignment, like right now, we're not going into some therapeutic process where maybe in a year you'll have a breakthrough. No, you come to me with a specific situation that's stuck right now in your life. I don't want to, I can't deal with people's big ticket issues. So if you have commitment issues, 
I'm not, I'll say, okay, great. Go see a, uh, you know, a relational therapist or something like that. If you have fear, okay, go to a somatic therapist. If your girlfriend gave you an ultimatum for next week and your fear of commitment is manifesting right now and you're paralyzed and you don't know what to do about it and you're trying to at, at least get unstuck so you can handle the situation the best you could, you can. That's something that I help people with. It's a specific uh -huh. stuck point in that's happening in their lives now. So in a sense, I work from the outside in. Uh, we take an actual real world outside event that's happening and from there of course it's gonna we're gonna get into all of a person's history and issues and stuff like that but the difference between me and say my dad or a therapist is i'm not going to take you all the way back to your childhood to the trauma let's just assume that you were traumatized i know you were i was too the question is what's your intention right now and what is it in the way your mind is misaligned that's having you not be able to live true to your intentions because if you were living living true to your intentions, it wouldn't bother you. You'd, you'd be comfortable in the situation. You'd be at rest. You'd be at peace. So kind of like a chiropractor would get in there and figure out what's misaligned in the spine or the nervous system, what, what vertebrae are clashing with each other, which nerves are pinched or out of joint or whatever. So that's the other thing I do. Um, I have Sounds like I'll need to book in for you. Lyrics to go. Sorry. Sounds like I need to book in with you next week. But, uh... I, I, <laughs> but next one thing week I, love... I have a... Nick, next week I have a few openings. I got to say, I've been getting more bookings since the book came out. I got to say, it's definitely picking up. I um, One thing I love about this series is I've interviewed psychologists, philosophers, creative artists, and here I have someone who ticks all three boxes. <laughs> and it, it's one of the fun things of bringing this, this this series together is is questioning normality from so many different perspectives. And you've worked, tackled the problem for the last four years in, in working on this book. So yeah. let me launch in with the with the big question. What yeah, is normal? Please. Good God. Well, I mean, the, the word itself has several definitions and uh, it's important to tackle them separately, I think. So as we say in the introduction of the book, in, in the medical field, um, there is a use of the word normal that is really just about certain parameters within which human life is possible and or optimal. So you know, our body temperature has a pretty narrow range of acceptable fluctuations, right? And if you're above normal body temperature, you have a fever. And if you're below normal body temperature, I don't know what it's called, but it's not good for you. And if you get above or below a particular threshold, you're dead. There is no life. Ooh. So th that, that normal is a range of acceptable variability. And it's in the case of body temperature, pH levels, I don't know what else, uh, so the, the toxicity, the presence of certain chemicals, whatever, you know, normal levels are important to maintain. Same thing with, you know, the levels of whatever in drinking water or air quality. When It's important for us to know what normal levels are because those are the levels that are needed to sustain life. Um, and then there's also in the medical field, normal in, in terms of statistical norms. So, you know, if a person um, takes three weeks to clear an infection, the doctor might say, okay, this is, that's normal to the person, or that's a little quicker than normal, or that's slower than normal. And those, those are just norms against which we can gauge progress. They're just quantitative norms, you might say. But Normal in the ordinary course of human life, human affairs, is basically whatever we're used to. Because one of the things human beings are remarkably gifted at is getting used to stuff. And that is um, a corollary of one of our greatest strengths and unique gifts and abilities as a species, which is our adaptability there really are very few species in the world that can that can live in so many different environmental conditions as we can. I love that quote in the book, um, the the genius for getting used to new sets of conditions. Um, yes. And it's a, it's a great turn of phrase. And, and, and it's interesting how those ranges of, of normality that the, sort of like the tolerance levels as well of our sense of normality, because, um, you know, extreme heat, you get burn, uh, extreme cold, you'll get hypothermia, but, then you've get, got people coming along like Wim Hof who say, hey, actually, you know, you can climb mountains in board shorts <laughs> and, and your yeah. body will be able to tolerate it. 
And if you if you acclimatize your body mm. over time, he doesn't yeah. suggest that someone plunge themselves into cold water immediately. It's, there's a series of grad, graduated practices so that your body realize, oh, 10 seconds in this water, I can handle. And then you develop whatever the brown fat, whatever, whatever the 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 substances that thank he, you for that his, caveat because yes i don't want to yeah. advocate anyone going out there but but that's the but that's the point it's about adaptability over time to the point where what was seemingly out of reach becomes becomes reachable and that's the thing that human beings can do much more than really any other species i can think of and so in the book you're saying that we are adapting to a toxic culture we're yes so we've been able to adapt to all kinds of physical environments and we are also able to adapt to many social environments. There's been, think of all the different kinds of cultures and societies there have been in the world, you know, in, in human history. We are a very, very malleable species. The culture we happen to be living in is one that puts a whole lot of stock in normality, um, that really wants to believe that the way things are, are the way things have to be and mm -hmm. i guess most cultures find a way to justify their their way of doing things by recourse to a notion of human nature and norms um but ours is pretty sure of itself that we are the pinnacle of achievement it's the end of history we are you know we are civilized what the book is saying actually is that these so-called norms that we're living in are highly abnormal with regards to actual human design for lack yeah, of a better yeah. word um human uh, development human evolution and that even though we can strictly survive in these environments we are paying the cost in terms of phenomena afflictions plagues besetting us that we've come to think are just a normal part of life mm. like the rising rates of cancer the rising rays of rates of autoimmune illness, uh, multiple sclerosis, rheumatoid arthritis, scleroderma, all kinds of stuff like that. The rising rates of addiction and suicidality and mental so-called illness. And we, it's not that we like these things. We rage, we wage battles against them. You know, the war on cancer and the war on addiction. But we, what we don't seem to consider is that there's a much bigger question to ask than how do we cure these things? But why are these things happening now in greater and greater numbers? Might it be that some of the things we take to be normal about the way we live are actually, you know, we're paying a toll on them in the form of our mental and physical health. hundred percent, hundred percent. And I think, you know, I think it was Viktor Frankl who, who first said that being sick in an ill society is, is not sick sickness. That's, that's a normal response to an abnormal society. And, yeah. and your book is taking that even further in the sense that um, you're, you're not just saying that, you know, well, you know, having mental health conditions in response to a sick society is to be expected. You're going even further by saying, ah, we can even trace this even further to autoimmune conditions and other fit problems that are seen to be physical health problems that are actually arising from early life trauma, trauma arising from a society that is ill-suited for the health of human beings. Yeah, early life trauma, and then I'd say continued stresses on the individual with with reduced social supports and no recognition that trauma is even a thing. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. It, would be one, it would be one thing if every child born into this society got good and traumatized in the first couple of years and then got all the support they need to sort it out. And, in, you know, and, you know, like if there was some kind of terrible rite of passage that we ought to go through, but then with them, then we get to emerge into a world that supports us and holds us and takes our needs seriously and says, Hey, I see your pain and, and doesn't further stress us with social alienation and abnormal levels of competition and atomization and individualism that runs against our nature and economic prerogatives that 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 impose on us or economic imperatives sorry that that impose on us intolerable levels of uncertainty and loss of control all mm. these things that are just bad for human health yeah but our society does all of those things so it not only trauma it not only creates conditions in which we're likely to be traumatized either by commission or omission which i can get into if you like yeah but, but then it compounds it by creating a situation in which the trauma cannot even be seen because our coping mechanisms that we use to get through the trauma become normalized as our 
personality is our strength. This is the way it needs to be. And then we even celebrate some of those, those, um, yeah, traumas. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really cool. yeah. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Like <laughs> someone who has overcome those obstacles, and then we we celebrate that person for overcoming those obstacles, even though those the things that the, that person have, has gone through are not necessarily things to celebrate. Well, yeah, or at least I mean, and, and there's a great example in the book of Hillary Clinton where yes, you know, we do have a whole chapter on how traumatized our leaders are, and there's a reason for that. Um, and, and, you know, we see them as great paragons of this or that value, or, you know, they're going to lead us out of this. We're looking to them to, to heal our trauma. In fact, they themselves are some of the most traumatized people in society. And my dad tells the story of uh, watching the inauguration, uh, sorry, not the inauguration, the, um, what's it called? The democratic convention where she accepted the nomination to be the candidate in 2016. Yeah. And they played a documentary on in, on the television broadcast and in the convention hall narrated by none other than the voice of God himself, Morgan Freeman, where um, she tells a story of uh, coming home one day in her neighborhood in, in Chicago as a four-year-old running into the house in tears because kids in the neighborhood were picking on her. And her mother said, you get out there and you deal with those kids yourself. There's no room for cowards in this house. And this was meant and celebrated by everyone in the crowd and totally not even commented on by the commentators as some kind of example of inspiring parenting and yep. resilience building. Yeah. And actually what it's what it was building was repression and a kind of tough persona that's really just an ice field crusted over a lot of pain. And then you can see it when she pushes herself to the point of collapsing from pneumonia on the street in New York a few months later when she's on the campaign trail. And you can see it in her lack of empathy for people when she calls people a basket of deplorables. And you can see it in her tough as nails way of getting through, you know, her husband's violations and transgressions, you know. And, and all sorts and of things that the media celebrated. Throw she, what's that? And all sorts of things that the media throw at people like that. And yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And she is. She does have a certain strength of personality, mm. but we mistake that for an authentic, um, full, full-blooded, inspiring um, self-determination. When in fact, a lot of it is really just a, a way of coping with really circumstances that should never have been celebrated in the way that they are. I, I find myself one thing I, I find myself admiring about politicians in particular is their resilience to critique like wow they just don't care how many people hate them and I, I'm, not, I'm not talking about any single politician i'm just so uh, 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 com over, overwhelmed by how many politicians just can get through the dirge of people throwing metaphorical mud at them the whole time and and it's not just politicians too who have these trauma stories which somehow people connect with and think yeah that's how to make it in this world like uh, Richard Branson comes to mind because if I'm recalling correctly he's got a story where as a young child um, one of his parents dropped him off on the other side of town and said okay now make it back home by yourself <laughs> and just left him in the middle and he had to figure out at a really young age how to get home from the other side of town at an age where other parents would be thinking, my gosh, you don't leave a child alone by itself um, to, you know, and, and whereas he sees that story as a resilience building part of his well, narrative. I'm sure, he, I'm sure he does. And maybe it is in a certain respect, but there's something that gets bleached out of the storytelling, which is the pain and fear of a child. And he has now created a persona around being bigger than that and tougher than that and stronger than that and smarter than that. And I hate to tell him, but you can't outrun the pain that a child feels in that situation. And not only that, if you have the kind of parents who would do that to you on one day, then the rest of your days are also going to be spent measuring up, proving yourself, and most importantly, suppressing parts of your emotional repertoire. You know, fear, vulnerability, um, uh, these, these very childlike stages we have to go through in order to become genuinely strong mm. have to be suppressed in a home like that now 
look, there are healthy societies that have rites of passage that put children through really difficult tests, but A, they wait until they're a certain age, B, they go through them with their peers and C, it's overseen by wise elders and it's transmitted culturally. It's not one family's capricious, um, sadistic or, or um, I don't know, harsh way of punishing or, 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 or disciplining a child. And a lot of kids in this culture have to develop tough as nails, the kind of mindsets that end that, that could predispose them to being moguls and billionaires, but also bullies, bullies, miserable people, uh, emotional cripples, mm. uh, you know, um, and, um, and, and very broken people on the inside. And how many celebrities have you heard about who, in, you know, project a certain thing outwardly, but inwardly, anyone who knows them or had to be around them, they either suffered terribly or they made others suffer terribly or both. And these are the people that we venerate. They call we are the these are the people we put in the firmament of our culture and call them stars. And and there's a lot of uh, pay it forward about that trauma. Like in moving forward with that attitude, they're normalizing their own experiences, and then normalizing the brutality of that for others as well. Oh, 100%. So yeah, yeah. And you, you you say you know you can admire the the imperviousness, the impermeability of politicians in terms of people throwing mud at them well that's true and to a certain extent i could admire that but there's also an imperviousness to being held to moral account there's an imperviousness to other people's pain alice miller the Sw the swish psychologist did a study of the childhoods of all of the worst nazi criminals you know mm, yeah. Goering, goebbels uh hitler 201 they all grew up in this what she called the poisonous pedagogy harsh punitive parents and we're not talking about parents with like tight curfews we're talking about corporal punishment screaming emotional starvation of these children and uh, just uh, training them that the that world the world is a brutal place in which only the so-called strong survive and what's also amazing is that you know a team of psychiatrists i think in um examined uh, albert eichmann i think prior to his trial in nuremberg and they deemed him perfectly normal one of them said he's even mm. more normal than me. So you think that a terrible childhood would fuck somebody up for the rest of their life and, and you know, leave them on the street or crazy or obviously. But in our society, some of the most damaged people end up at the highest levels of power. You look at Donald Trump as a cardinal example of someone who's just carrying his wounds. It's almost cartoonish, but he's, oh, turned, yeah. them in, he's turned them into this bluster and... Um, and it's something that attracts half the population to him and repels the rest of the world. Yeah. So yeah, we're living in a society where it's tough to find role models in power of people who are actually living in their wisdom and their wholeness and who aren't carrying and denying and pushing away and then re-inflicting on others serious traumatic wounding. In some ways, I feel that consumer society has replaced the negative controls on degenerate behavior and replaced it with the positive drivers of you should be like this. You should be successful. You didn't train hard enough. You need to train harder. You need to work through that problem. You need to, you need to achieve, achieve, achieve. You need to buy, buy, buy. You need to produce, produce, produce. And there were the, the negative controls were taken away, but we re replaced them with these po positive drivers that said, you need to attain a certain level of wealth. You need to attain a certain level of social status and if you don't reach it well that's your problem that's your fault you know and i think this may be this might be in some way circling back to um the area you flagged before about commission and omission i think it's the difference between the big t and small t traumas that we write about in the book okay. so big t is bad things that happen so a you know traumatic event a traumatizing event like the death of a parent early in life or being an orphan or abandoned or sexually abused or beaten. Um, all of these are events, discrete moments and events and happenings that leave their mark on a person's psyche and soul and body. Um, but then there's the traumas of omission, which are the good things that didn't happen. Those are small T traumas. Um, children are born with certain needs. They need to be loved unconditionally. They need to have their emotional growth supported by having their entire emotional repertoire 
embraced and allowed. Um, and, and this is, you know, we're not saying that, obviously, at some point, children need to learn which forms of expression are going to be socially acceptable and all that kind of stuff. But the only foundation on which a child can securely become socialized is one where they know that it isn't that there are certain parts of themselves that are that are shameful or unacceptable, but rather they know their whole self and they can make choices about how they how and where they want to express themselves. Mm. Born, being born into a situation that's stressed, where parents don't have the bandwidth to fully accept who a child is, to fully see the child because they're looking through their own traumatized, distorted filter. Even in a, a very, very loving home where there's no violence, verbal or physical children can be left with those kinds of wounds internally because trauma isn't about the external happening it's about the internal mark that it leaves so a child that gets the message oh my anger isn't acceptable they may learn that it's better to squelch the anger not even feel it become a nice kid and then that helps them get through life very nicely just later in life they're depressed or later in life they're developing an immune disorder um we lose touch with parts of ourselves. Anytime we lose touch with parts of ourselves or our access to parts of ourselves is diminished or constrained, we call that a trauma. That's a wound. That's a long, a lasting impact of something that happened. And any of these things and in combination with each other can be um, very detrimental, deleterious to health and wellness in both the physical and mental realms, which are not really two different realms at all. I can't imagine anyone wants to take their trauma and goes, oh, I'm going to throw this at my the next generation. And yet by not questioning it, by, by accepting it as normal, we're paying it forward. Yeah, well, I think it it's even more insidious than that because I think sometimes we pay it forward because we're thinking, I need to teach my children about this terrible world. Yeah. I need to prepare them for yeah. I mean, there, there's a, a, a mini series on one of the streaming platforms right now called under the banner of heaven about a murder, uh, a double homicide in the Mormon community in Utah. And what's depicted is, you know, just the, the, the rigidness with which these, the, the religious, the fundamentalist Mormons that is uh, raise their children. And why are they doing that? Because they believe they're living in a scary, hostile world that wants to kill them and wipe out their kind. And that's what they've absorbed through the generations and history has given them evidence that that's true. And, you know, you see the same thing, you know, I could choose my own faith, you know, the Jewish faith. We have now Jewish settlers in the West bank on Palestinian land. It's the, it's the Jewish high holidays right now. There are Jewish, Jewish teenagers and parents and kids going out and throwing rocks at Palestinian homes and vehicles and burning down Palestinian olive groves. Why are they doing that? Because they're pure demonic evil? I mean, whatever, if you believe in that. I think it's because they're scared human beings who have who have ingested a poisonous worldview mm. based on that's the that's one of the terrible inheritances of centuries of oppression, persecution, and trauma, which has completely created a distorted, uh insane view of things that says we have a right to be here and anyone who was here first needs to go and they're not human. I mean, this is just, so it's, it's we, 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 so we pass these things down sometimes accidentally, but I think we also sometimes pass them down deliberately under the guise of passing something else down. And we're not trying to traumatize our children. We're trying to educate them, season them, prepare them, train them for the world that we think exists. That's incredibly horrifying when you stop to think about it. Yes, it is. And it happens all over the world in every culture. Mm. Um, and, you know, we would like to think that being traumatized would make us more trauma aware. Um, it, but it's that's what, not necessarily the case. It's one of the reasons I think it's so important to ask what is normal, because in situations like these examples you've just provided, it's one group of people privileging privileging their sense of normality over another group. You know, this is my normal. And it, you know, if I'm outraged about this and I, you know, and I want to spread this out to other people and it's, it's incredibly harmful, harmful if you don't question the norms that you've come to grow up with. And if you don't question the dominant narrative, if you don't question what you've learned in healthy ways and yes, well, this is, but this leads to a question. Why would you question it? 
And the book is suggesting, because you're never going to question norms if they're working for you. Mm. You think they're working for you better than the alternative. Why in the world would you question it? Normal is very comfortable in that way. It's a padded, it's a padded chair. Yeah. It, it, it gives you at least the comfort of, well, it's better than the alternative. And that's the working assumption. But then you have to take a look at, okay, how comfortable is it? Maybe there's spikes going into my ass that I haven't seen. Why, 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 why am I bleeding? Uh, you know, maybe there's, maybe there's, there's pins underneath this cushion. Um, and the book is suggesting that if we actually pause for long enough to just ask the question, how good do we have it really? How is, how, you know, you say it to someone sometimes, how's that going for you? Well, how's normal actually going for us? Mm. Where the rubber meets the road, if we actually take a look at our culture, we look around us at our families, our workplaces, look in our own lives, the closer we look, I think it's harder and harder to say, oh, things are better than never. Things are fine. You know, normal isn't working the way it's it should. Normal should earn its keep. Normal should be, you know, the best the best of what's around, as Dave Matthews. Normal saying. should earn its keep. You know, uh, but 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 it doesn't actually. If you actually take a look at it, what are we getting in the bargain? More sickness, more illness, more misery, more fracture in families, less of a sense of self knowledge and purpose and and alignment with nature. And we're getting a burning climate, and we're getting political polarization. So at a certain point, any giving up anything we're addicted to, and normal is the biggest addiction there is. You have to hit bottom and you get to decide where bottom is, but it, it, it requires saying, actually, this isn't all it's cracked up to be. This isn't working so well. I don't know what else is possible, but at least I'm going to open myself to the question. I think normal has been so good at offloading responsibility and outsourcing its problems. And, you know, if there's a, a food shortage in, in the epicenters of normality, then we just go to a different provider. Um, and we don't care that there's a famine happening in Ethiopia. We don't care about the wars out breaking out in other countries, as long as we maintain a sense of normality in these epicenters of, of, of the home of normality. And yet that's that, that's the flux of that is creating so many problems around the world. The flux of the, the addiction of normality. And I like that phrase, the addiction to normality, um, is is being felt not by the people in the epicenters per se in the immediate now, but it's being felt by the people who are supporting the infrastructure of normality in those places in the sense of providing the, the, the goods and services, providing the, the raw materials, providing the work, providing the labour. And yet in the epicenters, people are living these incredibly traumatised lives, but sort of blind to that trauma. Am I? Well, I, I, I mean, yes and no. I would say that any system that's based on inequality is going to find crafty ways to outsource the most uh, obvious kinds of pain and suffering as far away as possible. So we do yeah. that very well, even within a even within a city. You know, we keep the polluted air over there with those people. And we have the green leafy trees over here. It, it, it happens on every level, every cosm, you know, the micro and the macro. Um, and yes, the global economic system definitely serves my kind much more than it serves, you know, a Bushman in the in the outback of your country or uh, an Indonesian sweatshop worker or anything like that. Yeah. There's different positions in the hierarchy. That said one of the premises of these books is that even here at home in the center of, you know, I like what you said, the epicenter of normality, we could say, you know, how history is written by the winners. Well, normality is decided by the winners in a sense, but even within our normal, we are not doing so well. Like mm. the, the first line of the book is in the most health obsessed society in human history, all is not well. Mm. And if we actually stop and look, there are crises mounting upon crises upon crises to the point where it's harder and harder to hide. So yeah. we can keep, and so then denial becomes the only recourse. Say, no, we're fine, we're fine, we're fine. Well, I think one of the reasons these, these, I think one of the reasons this book has landed the way it has, and quite frankly, the 
the reception has surprised even me. I didn't expect us to debut on at number five on the New York Times bestseller list. It's doing well. All doing well in Australia. Number one in Australia, you said? Uh, in, in one bookstore Australia. chain, it's number one. one. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's, it's definitely up there in Australia. I, I think that would not be the case if everyone agreed with the notion that normal is going great for most of us. Mm, 100%. People are suffering and people are more and more aware that they're suffering and they're suffering in multiple intersecting ways, which are not distributed equally, uh, but they don't really spare anyone either. Picking up that, um, picking up the, 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 the theme of inequality for a second, um, you mentioned social alienation and social um, dislocation a little bit earlier. And this is something that you bring up in the book. And I think it's a really interesting area to just tease out a little bit. Can you tell us a little bit more about the processes of social, social how, how normal is implicated in processes of social alienation? Hmm. Okay, I can try. I'm just aware that I'm, I'm start, I'm, maybe I have been doing this all interview. I'm certainly straying outside of my personal realms of expertise. I'm, I can speak to these issues by virtue of the fact that I wrote this book and I read it out loud for the audiobook and I know it inside out. I haven't studied in any of this stuff myself. So some of this is from personal observation and some of it is just kind of um, summing up what's in the book. But alienation has a lot of different meanings. Um, we can be alienated from, I mean, alien, alienation contained in the word is alien, right? Strange, we become strangers to ourselves, to each other. We become estranged from our nature and, and from meaningful work from meaningful play, recreation, from creative work, from nature itself. These are all kinds of alienation. And we quote mm. the great Scottish labor leader, Jimmy Reed, who gave a great speech about how you know alienation is the, is the main plague besetting modern life, but it's also part and parcel of modern capitalism. Um, and we just, I mean, take your pick. You walk down the street, and if you open your eyes and say, okay, let me look and see if I can find alienation, you'll see it everywhere. Mm. Billboards in everyone's line of vision that block the view of the sky and put giant words in your head that mean nothing. And they're all about buying some product or mm. trying to buy some particular body that they want you to think you need to have. So alienate this from a sense of true satisfaction, creating false needs, yeah. which consumer capitalism thrives on. It has to create desires which then it reframes as needs which then supplant our real needs so then we try to get the false needs and when we get them they don't satisfy so we need more which keeps the cycle of growth and consumerism going um people in their phones all over, all over the place not looking at each other not interacting i mean it's almost banal to even yeah. list this stuff but um for me one of the simplest examples would be as soon as you say to someone that's not normal you're telling that person to be inauthentic how so well, you're saying, well, you know, if there's a behavior or something, you say, oh, that's not normal. And then that person goes, oh, gosh, that's not normal. Okay, well, I can't do what I feel like saying or feel right. like doing. Right, right, right. Well, this is one of the corollaries of the um, of the title of the book, The Myth of Normal, because if normal is a myth, then so is abnormal. And the fear of being abnormal is a power powerful ideological tool to keep us in our place. But actually, if we realize that the whole notion that it's abnormal to be depressed in this society is completely false. That in fact, depression is an expression of a life lived in a world just like this, mm. which doesn't mean give up and live that way, but realize you're not alone because to say you're abnormal is to literally cast someone out or effectively cast someone out from some imagined class of people called the normal ones of whom mm. there are none in fact, <laughs> um, and to say you are on your own, which loneliness is a big facet of alienation. So you're actually entrenching that. And one of the antidotes for that, a tonic for that, is realizing your connection to other people, both in terms of my afflictions, my addictions, my illnesses, my mental conditions are an expression of the relationships I've had in this social world that I live in. But also my suffering connects me to others who are currently suffering. And they have their own stories. And none of us are alone. So... Um, yeah, alienation is a, a powerful force and it's a powerful facet of this myth that we normalize that keeps us apart from each other and keeps us from 
getting together long enough to have conversations like this where we might plot and scheme for a better world. I like plotting and scheming. It's good. A, book, a word that comes up a lot in the book is authenticity. Let me ask you uh, a really basic question. And what do you mean by authenticity? What? How can we have some really concrete ways of making sense of that word? Yeah, well, it's tricky, right? Because authenticity is another one of these words that capitalism can sell us an ersatz version of. You know, like, I like you, like Daniel. A, <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's all the, the devil's in the details, and the details are everywhere. Yeah. Um, you know, authenticity be yourself, you know, like you're gonna become yourself by buying this brand of makeup or wearing this shirt or listening to this band or going on this vacation. Authenticity has become a, a lifestyle brand I... in the hands of consumer capitalism. However, what we're saying is that, you know, if you put that bastardized, hollowed out version of authenticity aside, there is something called, there is a force called human authenticity. And I don't want to get too essentialist about it. Like there's one authentic self and you need to find that authentic self. Like that's kind of a trap. But authenticity is an energy. It's a state of being um allowed to be who one is authentic you know authentic means true to oneself uh be it means being the author of one's own life it means being the authority on one's own life it means that we're in touch with our gut feelings and that the way we live and the way we think and the way we speak and the way we feel springs from a connection to the person we were born as the person we were born to be so an authentic you know expression of authenticity would be you know um one of our human ancestors is out on the on the savannah in, in Africa, just hanging out, and they get a gut feeling that maybe there's a jaguar over that hill. Well, if they don't, if they don't have the ability to listen to their gut feelings, how long are they going to survive? Yeah, yeah, they're gone, right? So, similarly in human life, our gut feelings tell us when a situation is safe, when it's not, when a person is actually who they seem to be, when they're not, when we're feeling hungry when we're feeling not when we're feeling horny when we're not when we're feeling open and vulnerable when we're feeling closed and guarded and being able to listen to authentic impulses is part of living an authentic life now i don't think anyone can try to be authentic but what we present in the book i mean certainly what we lay out is the case that the ways in which each of us has had to sacrifice parts of our authenticity in order to survive are now taking a toll on us that we can no longer support that, you know, our health really requires that we regain our connection to the authentic threads of ourselves that we've been severed from. How do you do that? Well, you do it by just noticing where am I being inauthentic? Where am I saying yes when actually my body is saying no? Mm. Where am I where am I keeping silent when what I want to say is hell yes? Mm. Where am I pushing away certain certain feelings of mine only to regret it later? What are my habitual ways of betraying myself? The minute the part of you wakes up that can ask those questions and see, well, that's an authentic part of you that's looking at the inauthentic parts. And that's the awakening of, of a new perspective where it's like, oh, okay, I want to be more in touch with my feelings in the moment. And maybe I get quicker at regretting my, my self-denying choices. And maybe I get so quick that I regret them in advance before I do them. So my, it's a it's a kind of it's a direction to move towards not some kind of final destination. My way of making sense of of um, this uh, fantastic message that you just shared with us is that it, in a society where social pressures are coming at us hard and fast, and um, society is just telling us to go go go, yeah, it's about how do we find how do we craft a little bit of room to go? Okay, what are my instincts saying right now? What what how do I feel about that? And having room to question those instincts for a second as well. Like, oh, is this a moment I want to listen and trust them? Or is this a moment where, no, I'm feeling those things because of something I've lived early on in life. And actually, that's actually not in response to what's happening in front of me. And and am I responding in a way that is normal to respond? Or am I responding in a way that I choose to respond? And, I, and that, that can be two very different things. Yeah, I mean, to me, the word normal, now that I've written a book about it and all that, it's, it I, it doesn't have much use for me. Yeah. Um, I, I, you know, I might say, is this the way I've been taught to respond? Or is this the way that I actually am moved to respond? Is this the way that 
um, I'm habituated to respond and that I like I'm used to responding and I get a kind of hit out of responding that way. Like if I get, I can get really pissy with my dad sometimes if he so much as, you know, says the wrong thing. And there's a part <laughs> of me that would, would, would love never to stop doing that because I get a little hit, but it's the same hit I've been getting since I was three. And there's a big downside. I also feel shame and, and regret and lonely and powerless it comes with a feeling of powerlessness. So there's something inauthentic about that in that it's not true to who I am now. It's a relic or, or re a vestige mm. of a time in my life when I was powerless and all I had available to me was little tantrums. So then the question is, well, what's the authentic thing to do right now? And sometimes the answer is, I don't know. Mm. And that sometimes is the most authentic answer when we've lived a lifetime of habituated reactions to just say, actually, I don't know what the authentic thing right is right now. And then I pause and I wait and I give it some space. And that's where something new can, you know, emerge. And it, so, so it's about, does this feel natural to me? Is, is this my nature? Is this me talking or is this my conditioned habits? And it's hard to not do anything. You know, it's hard to sit there and go, I don't know. And I'm going to wait. That's, because... why, that's why people, that's why people meditate. Yeah, but and it's, they, you know, and, it's, and they work, they, they practice it. I mean, I don't, but I've tried it, but I, yeah. I take it. That's what that's for C cultivating that neutral place, that observing watchful place where one can see, okay, I could do this. I could do that. I could just sit here and observe. Daniel, I've loved this conversation and I could have, I would have loved to enter every single strand that we've gone, gone down, but let me ask you, what questions should we ask about normality? I think the the main question is how's that going for me? Yeah. How is it actually going for me? That's a good one. Um, what are the costs? What are the benefits? That's that's a good capitalist question. What what are the perks? What what do I get out of my normals? You know, what am I used to? What are the little treats and Scooby snacks that I get out of? You know, continuing the way things are. Uh, what has it gotten me? So even when we talk about things like addiction, right? My dad, one of my dad's main questions to people is not what's wrong with the addiction, what's right with it? What's it done for you? Every addiction did something for someone, made them feel loved, special, warm, spontaneous, killed pain. Yeah. It awoke something in their heart that was numb. So what have I been getting out of it? Where did it come from? Where did I learn that this was normal? And what are the costs? What's it actually costing me? And even more so on the social level. You know, especially for those of us who live in, you know, we're, we're relatively privileged. Like I said, there isn't necessarily a, an incentive screaming in our face every day to wake up and change things because the way things are is going just fine for us. What did it take for Neo to wake up in the Matrix? He was doing just fine. He had no interest in waking up. <laughs> Something had to crash into his life and intervene and scare the fuck out of him and then give him a choice. And something in him said, OK, let's take the what pill was it? The red pill? Oh, yes. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I can't remember. I keep, he took a pill. I keep, coming, I keep coming back to the to, to the Matrix metaphor because it, it's a great pop cultural example of someone waking up to realize that their normal had narcotized them into a life that was less than what they were capable of living. Yeah. And that the authentic life is much more dangerous and much more scary, but it's also more exciting. And it's just much more true. It, it, there's, it, mm. It's a life worth living rather than a life just worth sleepwalking through. And I think that that's ultimately what normal asks of all of us to really ask, okay, what of this is really me? And what of this do I really want to keep investing in? And how is it really going? You really made me stop and think there when you said, how is normal working for you? I think that's such a great question. And, and I hope <laughs> sometimes when I watch these interviews again, I see my face and I'm like, I'm actually thinking really hard there, but I look like I'm completely disinterested. <laughs> and you really made me stop and think because it, it is a great question to ask. How is normal working for me? And, and let, me, let me question the assumption of that because I've made make, using normal as an assumption all my life and it's got me to this point, but sometimes, well, yeah. Actually, it's worth asking, maybe it's not working for me. Yeah. And then the other question I would ask is, what seemed normal to me yesterday that doesn't seem normal to me today? What seemed normal to me last week or a year ago that I look at today and I'm like, that's weird. Track the progress of your waking up to see things, to, to question things and to not take things for granted and to have, 
you know, cause it's not going to happen all at once necessarily. You're not going to all of a sudden the veil is lifted. I don't think we, most of us can handle that, but bit by bit, you see glitches in your own matrix and you're like, wait a minute. That's, I've been, I was putting up with that or wait a minute. This is how we talk to each other at work. Or I've been walking around with this pain in my gut literally for years, or I've been suppressing this kind of emotion for this long. It, it starts to dawn on you. And once you start to invite that kind of dawning of awareness, I think it tends to build on itself. It's a yeah. kind of momentum. Normality has cumulative harm. Absolutely. It yeah. does. And healing has cumulative momentum and cumulative power. Um, and um, yeah. As you were saying that I was... Normalize, normalize healing. Just normalize something else. I was uh, I was uh, getting a vision of one of your characters in a play that you're you're yet to write, having a monologue about questioning their normality. <laughs> I want to see this. I want to see this. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Sounds like a sounds like a a great show stopping song. So I just realized how insensitive that is for me to say. You've just finished this incredible amount of work. Go go, go do more work. <laughs> no, please. I I need to be sent back to the piano at this point. Well, I'd love to see. I'd love to hear more of it. And Daniel, thank you for being such a wonderful interlocutor. How do you say that word actually in Canada? What's that? That's exact interlocutor, yeah. Oh, okay. Because I've heard it pronounced numerous ways and I never know if I'm pronouncing it correctly because I've only ever read the word. <laughs> yeah, it's inter it's interlocution, but I think it's an interlocutor. Interlocutor. Well, you've, I've, I've really enjoyed chatting with you. And as you were chatting away, I was like, if this guy comes to Australia, I'm taking him out for beers um, because, <laughs> yeah, open invite for whenever you're here um and what, what city are you in i'm in sydney i'm in sydney you're in sydney okay yeah yeah actually i should acknowledge the the, the camaragal country that I'm, I'm currently on um yeah. which is traditionally um the country of the camaragal people in fact the land that i'm on is um uh, traditionally women's land so it's a, a place of women's mm -hmm. gathering um mm -hmm. folklore and um song and um and uh, in fact in australia before major events they like to do an acknowledgement of country so to acknowledge the the land of the, of the people who were there um for more than sixty thousand years and um yeah. and i see that it's common common in canada too yeah your work is is going in a, in a really lovely direction of engaging more with indigenous perspectives and, and that's really lovely to see we could do worse and and we owe it to ourselves and to them you know it's crazy to me i grew up in the 1980s listening to pop radio and it it just says so much about where pop culture has gone that in when i was in sixth grade i was listening to midnight oil saying <laughs> the time has come to say fair is fair to pay the rent to pay our share the time has come a fact's a fact it belongs to them let's give it back that was a hit song that was a number one song on the radio that was like my version of like Billie Eilish or whatever the fuck is on the radio now. What is that? Like the 1980s were so incredible. There was actual real political content yeah, in, yeah. Our, in our pop music. And the lead singer went on to become a politician here in Australia. Did he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's gone back to the going back to the performing stage, but he spent a while in politics. And uh, um, yeah, there was a lot of a lot of high hope when he made it into politics and um, but I think he's he's gone back to the performance stage because he's um, able to rally people a bit more on that front. Yes. Yeah, we all make a difference in different ways. Yeah. Well, once again, thank you very much, Daniel Mate, author of The Myth of Normal, Trauma, Illness and Healing in a Toxic Culture. Looking forward to seeing you come to Australia one day and thanks for being a part of Idioms of Normality on Future Frame TV, the collective podcast series of Traces Dreams. Thank you. I can't wait. 